Thank you, Pastor Brian. Um, I didn't think that this day would get here, but now I wish it wasn't here yet. <laughs> but um, tonight I'm going to be preaching a message. It's titled "Mary Had a Little Lamb," and um, yes, it's going to be it's going to be based off of the uh, nursery rhyme "Mary Had a Little Lamb." But don't worry, there will be some Bible in here, so you won't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, there is a story behind why I chose this topic and um, last year whenever my sister Kayla started learning the flute um, Miss Marsha had come up to her one day and had asked her if she like had any songs that she was able to play on the flute and Kayla said that she could only play Mary Had a Little Lamb and Miss Marsha was like well that's okay I mean Mary did have a little lamb and uh, me being a blonde I didn't ever get that you know connection I was like hmm, that's pretty interesting and then uh, <laughs> then um, after that I that kind of actually interested me. I was like, you know, I wonder, wonder where that nursery rhyme actually came from. Wonder if it was maybe based off of the Bible. I didn't know, so I actually started doing some research, and I found out that the nursery rhyme was not related to the Bible whatsoever. But I started, you know, through my research, I started learning more about that nursery rhyme, and it was really interesting because the words, the words to that nursery rhyme were actually. It was, I could see how it could be related to the Bible, and I thought it was, it was just something that really interested me, so I thought that it would be, um, you know, something that would be interesting at least to tell others, you know, even if it's not based off of the Bible, it's something that we could still maybe learn something, um, and I, I do apologize that this, this isn't going to be really in a sermon form, it'll probably be more like a lesson, but um, nonetheless, I think that we can still get something from it. And like I said, you know, I will be using the Bible, so we can always get something from that. So um, just to give you some background on the nursery rhyme, there was a, a girl named Mary Sawyer, and she happened to live in Sterling, Massachusetts, and she had a pet lamb. And so one day her, one, one day her brother came up to her and said that she should take it to school. Um, just as a side note, don't ever listen to your brother, okay? Because that's not... They never really have good ideas, okay? But I'm the exception because I'm the smartest born kid. But, you know, other than that, other than that, you know, don't listen to your brother. They have weird ideas. But anyway, she, um, <laughs> she happened to take his idea. So she did take the lamb to school one day. And um, the same day that she did that, there was a man by the name of John Rulestone. Um, he was in town visiting his uncle, and he happened to see this affair happen with the lamb at school and everything. Um, it, of course, he was entertained by it, thought it was pretty funny. And then the next day, he went up to Mary and um, handed her this this um, nursery rhyme. Now um, he only he only wrote the three the first the first three stanzas of the nursery rhyme, which is the most common stanzas, and normally that's the only one that the people that the people would sing. But there's actually I think in total there's like eight different stanzas, and no one else really knows where the um, where the other stanzas came from. So um, you know I don't really have any background on that, but um, again, he, he was the one who wrote these, the first three stanzas at least. And um, So what I want to do is I'm going to go through the, the nursery rhyme and kind of take each stanza one at a time and kind of show you how I got something from the Bible and how I correlated it with the Bible. And again, like it, it's not really going to be a sermon form, but it will be, um, I think it'll be beneficial for us. So um, I'm just going to start by saying the first stanza of the nursery rhyme. It says, Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. Now, this one's pretty, pretty easy to correlate because, like I said at the beginning, um, you know, there was a woman named Mary who gave birth to Jesus Christ, and he was, our, um, he was the holy, spotless Lamb of God. But um, I kind of want to go a little bit further into that stanza and just show you that the second, part, the second part of that stanza says, whose fleece was white as snow. And I think that's really interesting because... Again, Jesus Christ was the spotless lamb. He was the lamb without blemish. He had no sin in him whatsoever, and he came to die on this earth for our sins. Um, if you recall, like in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice lambs to the Lord for uh, burnt offerings and stuff like that. And what they would do is they would try to find the, the lamb without blemish or without spot. And it's the same way that was supposed to be a picture for when Jesus Christ came onto this earth to die for our sins. Um, it says in... It says in Revelation 5.12, Revelation 5.12, it says, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. So we can clearly see that he was using that as a picture and that he was um, using a lamb as an example for him coming and dying on the cross for us. 
Um, the second stanza says, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Now this one is very uplifting to me because again, um, no matter where you are, Jesus is always there with you. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning that um, he's, the Lord is omnipresent, so he's everywhere. Um, he's always with us, and that's really helpful, especially, especially this past month, me stressing over this, this message. You know, it was, <laughs> it was really, uh, really uplifting to know that God was there for me, and he was helping me throughout the whole thing, so there's really no need for me to worry. Um, if you would, please, if you turn your, into your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. It says, um, verse number 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So we can see here from the Bible, he, he clearly states that he is never going to leave us. He will always be there for us. And um, again, it's something that, it sh should be something that should encourage us because of the fact that, there is no need to worry. There's, he's always going to be there for us. Um, and then if you would also please turn to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. <clears throat> and I'll be looking at, uh, read verse 24. Proverbs 18 chapter... Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, it says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now, the reason I wanted to read that verse is because I just wanted to say that not, not only is he always there for you, but he's your friend. So he's, you know, no matter, no matter what you're going through, he's going to be there to help you and guide you through anything that you're going through. Again, that was very helpful to me as I was preparing for this message to see that you know, there's, again, there's nothing for me to worry about. He's going to be there, and the same for all of y'all. It's, he's there for us. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us, and it's something that, you know, hopefully is very uplifting to y'all as well. Um, so then the next stanza of the nursery rhyme, it says, he followed her to school one day, which was against the rules. Now, the, the nursery rhyme wasn't the way I'm correlating with this, this stanza with the Bible, it doesn't necessarily, it's not the same meaning that the nursery rhyme had intended for it. But just for tonight's purposes, it says he followed her to school one day, which was against the rules. And um, nowadays, especially, especially in the 21st century, people try to do everything they can to get rid of Jesus Christ in their lives. Um, especially, especially in schools, just like the stanza says, it was against the rules. A lot of people try to get rid of him um, in schools. You know, they... Uh, in, just in their lives in general. They don't want to have to answer to someone. They want to be their own boss. They want to do whatever they want. So they don't ever, they don't ever want to have to answer to Jesus Christ. So they try to get rid of him and they try to come up with all of these things they can to try and get him out of their lives so that they don't have to answer to him. Um, you don't have to turn there, but in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, it says that uh, when, when King Herod finds out that um, Jesus Christ was born, it says that he was troubled. Um, King Herod was afraid of losing his throne. He, he wanted to be in power, and he, lo he loved the power, he loved the throne, and he didn't want to have to give that up. So whenever he found out that Jesus Christ was here, and they were calling him the, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he, he was troubled. He didn't want to, again, he, he himself did not want to answer to anybody. He wanted to be the person who was in charge. He wanted to be the one to make all of these rules. And and then 2,000 years later, you know, we're all still the same way. None of us, you know, people don't want to have to listen to Jesus Christ. They all want to make their own rules. And um, it's still going on. They, um, not, only, not only do they have to try to get rid of him, but um, the next stanza of this nursery rhyme says, it made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. And again, the nursery rhyme didn't mean it in this way, but again, for tonight's purposes, um, you know, people don't even have reverence for God. It says they, they, it made them laugh and play to see a lamb at school. They, um, people don't even have reverence for God. And me, me going to a public school, I hear all the time um, the Lord's name being used in vain. I hear um, people using curse words all the time. And it it's almost as if they use it every other word in their sentences. And, you know, you know, it's just 
they do, people do anything they can to mock God and to make fun of God. Um, I mean, there's so whenever whenever people at school are saying these words, you know, there's so many other words that they could use in place of those curse words or in place of using the Lord's name in vain. Um, but you know, they still choose. It's almost as if they purposefully choose those words. And um, again, from what from what I've seen going to public school. It seems like if you're not saying those things, it almost, see, it almost seems as if you're a wimp or afraid to say anything like that. And you're not the cool kid unless you're doing those things. And so just um, all, the, all the different ways that people try to mock God and make fun of God, it's something that's a, a real problem in today's world. And again, it says, made the children laugh and play. They just don't, they don't have any reverence. They don't show any reverence whatsoever. If you would please turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and in, in verse 7, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. See, the, the Bible clearly states, you know, Jesus clearly states that you should not be taking his name in vain, yet people are still purposefully taking his name in vain and still using those curse words and doing all these things that they should not be doing. And, you know, it's something that, we need to be careful of because, you know, it's going on in our world. We need to be careful not to do it ourselves. You know, there are times where, you know, even us as Christians will have these dirty thoughts or something like that. But um, we need to remember that, you know, we're supposed to be serving God. We're supposed to be praising his name, not using his name in vain. Those two stanzas are, you know, a reality of today. And they're something that are a big problem. But... I love this next, the next two stanzas of this uh, nursery rhyme. It says, And so the teacher turned it out, but still it lingered near. He waited patiently about till Mary did appear. See, the, fir the, f the first part says the teacher turned it out, talking about the lamb. The teacher tried to get rid of the lamb, turned the lamb out of the school, but still it lingered near. See, the world can do all they want to try and get rid of Jesus Christ, but no matter what, he's still going to be there for us. He's always going to be there. He'll never forsake us, leave us nor forsake us. Um, Again, it's something that's very uplifting, you know. Again, no matter what we're going through, he's always there, and he'll always be there for us. Um, and then it says, he waited patiently about till Mary did appear. And you can, you can take this stance in a couple different ways, because, again, he's going to be there for you no matter what, no matter what the world tries to do. But also, as Christians, you know, a lot of the times we stumble and fall, and we, um, we fall back in our, in our spiritual lives. But... Again, him being there, he's going to wait patiently. Um, no matter what we do, you know, ourselves, not just, the, not just the world around us, but us as Christians, no matter what we do, um, you know, he's still going to be there and he'll be willing to forgive us. Again, him um, being our friend that sticketh closer than a brother, he will be willing to forgive us and he'll, um, he won't hesitate to forgive us as long as we confront our sin with him. Um, the last two stanzas of this um, nursery rhyme, it says, Why does the lamb love Mary so, the eager children cried. Why Mary loves the lamb, you know, the teacher did reply. Now here's the only, here's the only part of the nursery rhyme that um, does not go along with the Bible. Because here it says, it says, Why did the lamb love Mary? And then it says, Because Mary loved the lamb. But really, it should be the other way around. You know, why do we love Jesus Christ? Because he first loved us. And that's the way we should be, that's the way we should be treat, you know, living our lives. You know, it's not like, I'm, again, Jesus is omnipresent and he, he never ceased to exist. He never will cease to exist. He's been here before us. He knew about us before we were in our mother's womb. And he loved us even before we were born. So there's no way that we could love him before he loved us. He did love us first, and that's why we should love him. <clears throat> I had another verse, but I don't remember where it was at. <laughs> oh, um, again, you don't have to turn there, but John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, God loved the world so much that he gave up his only son to die on the cross for our sins. And that was, again, that was 2,000 years ago. That was way before we were ever here on this earth. So, um, you know, we can see through that that, lo that God loved us first, and because of that, we need to love him. It, 
again, I apologize that this wasn't really a message, and I know it wasn't very long. <laughs> We're probably going to get out really early, but um, there are some things I do want you to get from this. Um, even though there wasn't a main, a main point to it, and it was more of a lesson form, um, there's still some things that I think we can get from this lesson. And the most important thing is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and that he loved us enough um, to give up, give up his only son. And even though we were sinners, and again, with the analogy of um, um, us, you know, my friends at school and all that stuff, um, using God's name in vain, cursing, all that stuff, all of the sins of this world, yet Jesus still was willing to give his only son to die on the cross for us. And that's the most important thing that I would like for you all to get from this is that you know, if, you, if you're here and you're not saved, now is a great time for you to get saved because we have no, we don't know if we're going to, we are not promised tomorrow. You know, the Lord could come back or, you know, we could pass away, anything like that. But if you're not saved, that's the most important thing. You need to get saved before it's too late so that we can spend eternity in heaven and not in hell. Um, but another thing I want you all to get is that he will always be there for us. You know, we don't have to worry, and I know I, <laughs> I had the trouble of that again this month, just stressing over this message, but every time I went through it, every time I practiced it, when I came to the end of this, I realized, you know, there is no reason to worry. You know, God is always there, and, uh, you know, it's just, it's, I'm not doing this for y'all, even though we can get something from it, but this is to glorify God, and it's something that, that was something that really helped me through this was to remember that this is for God and we're here to serve him. And part of that is by witnessing to others, telling others about Jesus Christ. But we need to remember that he's there for us and that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Um, that's the end of my lesson. I know it, was, know it was short and I'm sorry for that, but um, I pray that you know, you'd at least be able to get something from it and maybe walk away and you know, maybe that will help you at least maybe help you see nursery rhymes in different ways. But anyway, that's it, Pastor Brian.